Welcome to Knowledge, the official podcast of the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida State University. I'm your host, Amy Walden, the Assistant Director for Visual and Social Media with the college. And today we welcome Justin Kenimer, an Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at FSU. Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Justin is a member of the American Chemical Society and elected secretary of the Division of Polymer Chemistry. He's also a member of the Division of Polymeric Materials, Science and Engineering and the American Physical Society's Division of Polymer Physics. Bit of a mouthful there. It, it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So on today's episode, we're discussing polymer chemistry and some of the global problems that researchers are tackling in this field, including the strides being made to develop more sustainable and chemically recyclable materials. So before we dive into that, Justin, we'd love to learn more about you. You've been on the faculty here at FSU for almost 10 years and lead the Kenner Group Lab on campus. But first, take us back. How did you first become interested in studying chemistry? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting storyline. I mean, I, I did not consider myself an academic or anything towards science or what people would consider, you know, those uh, difficult majors or anything like that. When I was younger, I liked comic books and art and uh, music. Even up through high school, you know, I played baseball, did stuff like that. When I got to college, I was sort of a pre-major, took chemistry as a general elective, uh, and I did really well at it. Um, and that was kind of the first time that I think not only that I found myself doing better than average in an academic subject, but also the encouragement from the professors there certainly guided me. And then even as I took chemistry as a major, I was doing well in the classes, but I, uh, I didn't, I think, truly find a passion until I got to a polymer chemistry class that I had taken as an undergrad at Radford University, which is a small little university next to Virginia Tech, if you've never heard of it. Um, but great professors there, and they really cultivated my interests. So here the we are. The right professors makes all the difference, yes, I would say. I like to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> so for anyone listening who's not a chemist or a chemistry major, can you explain a little bit about what exactly polymer chemistry is? Yeah. So I think a, a common misconception is that it's plastics. Uh, people immediately think plastics. But actually, any material that you come across that's not a metal or a mineral is a polymer. Um, so this includes your skin, your cartilage, your hair, a tree trunk, the leaves, rubbers, um, you know, you name it. Uh, these are all polymers, whether or not they're naturally derived or synthesized in the lab. They all share features that is macromolecules. And so that's the area of chemistry that we're interested in, everything from skin to plastic. Yeah, and you're right. That is kind of what I thought of first was plastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your area's research here at FSU and what the Kenimer Group studies? Yeah, so we have a couple of different areas of uh, sort of research that we're invested in right now. Some of it's very fundamental, like the chemistry and the thermodynamics of polymerization. How do we make certain molecules turn into plastics or polymers or rubbers um, better? Uh, so that's just fundamental chemistry research right there. But towards the materials application side, we have some research aimed at developing biomass-based plastics. So 99% of the plastics we come across are from petroleum, which we know is a finite resource, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to get out of the earth, right? So um, if we can develop new plastics from other sources, sustainable sources, renewable sources, that certainly could alleviate some of that tension of, of fossil fuel needs. Um, we also have another growing project in the area of membrane development um, in the area of clean energy. So uh, inside of a battery, like a lithium ion battery, or inside of a fuel cell, which is, I think, an emerging technology, um, you're going to need some polymer components that do more than just behave like a plastic. They, they have a function, and they transport ions or protons or different things within that, within that cell. Um, and there's a lot of very deep, interesting chemistry that can be explored on making materials for that purpose. And your lab has been working on developing a new kind of plastic derived from pine sap. Can you yeah. tell us more about this and why researchers are excited about this? Yeah, I, I think that when you look at sustainable chemical feedstocks, non-petroleum-based chemical feedstocks, the immediate thing that you think of is, all right, we want it to be plentiful. We, we want it to possibly not be our food, right? Which, uh, you know, we've had some great developments in sustainable plastics, but a lot of that is from corn. Mm -hmm. And so there's always been a discussion about, 
do we really want our corn to be used toward plastics, right? That's a good point, yeah. Um, and so when you start to whittle down, like, what is a what is a critical kind of chemical that would be great to use, you start looking at things like pine sap, right? Pine sap is something that you can tap out of a pine tree. You don't even have to kill the tree. Of course, the, the pine lumber industry produces a lot of pine sap, it, just naturally anyway. And if you look at these chemicals called terpenes, often the fragrances that you have like pine scented candles and stuff, these are terpenes that are in pine sap that, that give it that aroma. But these chemicals are, they're actually, you know, some of them are useful, but some of them are not useful. And so they go into things like turpentine, like a solvent that you would use when you're doing oil-based paints. That's yeah. like the, the best use for them, <laughs> right? So we, we were interested in trying to find out whether or not we could sort of manipulate some of these chemicals to make them into what we call a monomer. A monomer is our synthetic precursor to a polymer. So mono means one and poly means many. So we attach the monomers together to a long macromolecule that we call a polymer. And that's when you end up with either a rubber or a plastic or something like that, right? Um, and so we had this real cool success story uh, a few years back where we modified alpha pinene, which is one of the major terpenes produced in pine sap, and we're able to turn it into a plastic. And currently we're, we're working to understand, you know, what is this plastic's what is it good for? What could we use it for? So That takes me right into the next question is what kinds of applications could this be used for? Where is that research at right now? Yeah, so because we're thinking bulk, you know, with this type of project, lots of pine sap making, you know, materials in a bulk scale, we can think less along the lines of advanced function, um, you know, like from, for example, getting away from like the fuel cell membrane to, to more material applications. Is this a good package? Is this a good container? Does it have good mechanical strength? Does it have good oxygen permeability? Things that we would rely on more bulk commodity plastics to do in our material world. And so that's sort of the avenue that we're working in right now. We're still at the very beginning fundamental stages of learning. Is it tough? Is it brittle? Uh, is uh, is an adhesive, you know, different things that we can learn about a new plastic. So it's very exciting for the students. Basically, any test they want to do is something we can learn about it, right? So it's, it's a lot of fun right now. That's great. And I'm really excited to see where that research is in a few years. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So last year, you were part of a multi-institutional team to receive a $2.2 million grant from the Department of Energy, and FSU President Richard McCullough, a chemist himself, highlighted the importance of this work for the future of clean energy. Can you tell us more about this grant project? Yeah. President McCulloch is a polymer chemist. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. He's, yeah. A, he's, a, he's not just a, chemist, a polymer <laughs> chemist. In fact, it's funny because I... Uh, I, I followed his work that he did at Carnegie Mellon on, on regioregular polythiophenes. When I was a grad student, those <laughs> materials actually weren't too far off from some of the partially conjugated materials we were working with. So it's just a, just a small world. Full like, circle yeah, moment. <laughs> full circle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I touched on this a little bit. You know, the, the, an emerging clean energy technology is, is fuel cell development. And uh, one of the reasons that it's sort of so exciting is because the byproduct of a fuel cell is water, right? So you can't get much better of a byproduct, right? We have CO2 problems with burning fossil fuels and stuff. So water as a byproduct is a great thing, and it can produce quite a bit of energy. Um, but you need a system, again, that, that sort of has a lot of functional components on the inside of it. Um, and mainly you need to transport ions, either protons or hydroxides, across a barrier, just like in a normal battery cell. There's been some, some front runners from industry that, that have been used for quite a while, like Nafion, for example. This is a fluoropolymer, and you've probably heard stories about forever chemicals and fluorochemicals. Yes. You know, so you know, fluoro materials in general are getting a little bit more scrutiny um, for their expense and then their their possible persistent waste. So um, industry is is looking for alternatives. And so we kind of uh, we started on just this project, kind of like, let's try this. It would be cool type of thing. And had ab fuel cells were not even in the, in the thought process at the time. We were just trying to make cool new materials. And as we developed this material more and more, we started to learn that this could be a potential application. And sure enough, it, it actually works quite well. It's competitive with Nafion uh, as far as the way it, it transports protons at certain hydration levels. Um, and so we, we got a patent, which was great. We're glad we did that. Um, we've had industrial interest, and then the DOE just awarded us that grant. 
And it's really exciting because that grant pulls in experts in material science and engineering, some at UPenn, uh, some at the University of Michigan. And so I'm the chemist, so I get to make all the cool new materials, <laughs> and then I get to sort of send them off to a university to be, you know, to develop and, and learn more about uh, their function and how they behave as a fuel cell material. So. You get the fun part is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're always waiting on me because synthesis takes a while. But, you know, once I make it, it's sort of like no one else has that available able to work with. So it's it's cool and new, right? It's an important part of the yeah. team for sure. Yeah. If someone's interested in studying chemistry or even more specifically, possibly organic materials or polymer chemistry, what advice would you give them to get started? You know, I think a lot of people are turned off by maybe chemistry or organic chemistry sometimes because it is difficult at first. Um, and I think we want an instant gratification in some of this stuff as to like, I, I want to understand it immediately and I want it to pay me back as much <laughs> as I put into it, right? Um, organic chemistry is a slow build. It's one of those things that takes time, but the more time you put into it, the more it starts to pay you back. And it really becomes exciting when you get to a level of knowledge in the subject that you can sort of foresee the way molecules come together. Um, and then if you can see how small molecules come together, you can start to envision how a macromolecule can come together and make a material. And so we do a combination of organic chemistry and kind of like architecture, right? So molecular architecture, but nonetheless, the architecture of the molecule becomes an important component. So it's a very uh, good design space for the creative mind. Um, and so to get started, obviously, you're going to want to take those core classes, but I would advise people to utilize the Internet. There's fantastic videos out there that can get you more interested in science. There's educational ways to do that on the Internet, too. Um, and then ultimately, if you're able to try to implement yourself into a research program or volunteer in certain community things that might be involved with science and education, those really connect you, I think, from from the classroom to the real life application and and just keep going. It's great yeah. advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we end every podcast with our bowl of mystery questions. So Justin, yeah. please draw a question. All right. And that we'll one. give you some time. Not look. Okay. <laughs> and the question is, what was your favorite subject in school? In high school, we had a, a high school that that actually had some technical drawing and, and, and intro to architecture classes. I don't know if that's common or not. But, no, I wouldn't but, say so. Yeah, it was a very it was a very like technical sort of side to the high school. Once you got to like a senior level, you could take these drafting classes and technical design classes. And I, a lot of a lot of benefits I got from those classes, not only from the creative drawing side. Um, you know, you would get points off if you're, if the corners of your drawing didn't specifically <laughs> meet at exactly the same spot, if it was just a little bit hanging over. So you really had to pay attention to detail. My handwriting certainly benefited from that, but, <laughs> but ultimately I was just a doodler when mm -hmm. I was younger. So I really enjoyed the, the craft of, of that technical drawing class. Well, and I think a lot of uh, aspects from that have carried over into your work today. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> well, Justin, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today on Knowledge. And if you would like to learn more about Justin Kenimer's research at FSU's Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, visit chem.fsu.edu. Thanks so much for tuning into Knowledge, and we'll see you next time.